Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this afternoon, we have an interesting IPC presentation. We are here to talk about tuberculosis. We're here to talk about tuberculosis, uh, commonly referred in short as TB, which is the most expensive respiratory infection to treat. And uh, at the same time, it causes a lot of morbidity in families causes a lot of loss of working hours and a lot of disabilities later in life for those who are infected. And of course, the ones who are affected suffer a lot of financial constraints, emotional constraints when they're taking care of their sick person with tuberculosis. I must uh, say that it also affects healthcare workers because as you know, all healthcare workers are usually exposed in a working environment. When we deal with patients every day, we deal with patients we don't even know what they're suffering from. That is the exposure we are talking about. So today as IPC, we are here to talk about uh, tuberculosis and we are concentrating mainly on prevention measures in uh, when it comes to TB. So the title for today is Infection Prevention Control Practices in Tuberculosis Management. And we have uh, with us Mr. Bernard Kirui, who is an IPC coordinator in Kenyatta National Hospital. He's going to take us through the practices, the precautions, and at the end of it, I'm sure we'd have learned one or two things for now to protect ourselves from tuberculosis. At the same time, we prevent transmitting it to our patients. So welcome, Mr. Kirui. Thank you, Mr. Kibiot. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm an IPC coordinator at Kenyatta National Hospital. And I'm going to take you, uh, to you through the infection prevention and control measures in uh, tuberculosis management. Uh, Oh, first, we are going to do uh, to talk about introduction. In introduction, infection prevention and control, IPC unit is mandated to ensure the safety of our patients and healthcare workers within the hospital. When we are normally, we achieve this through continuous training, and sensitization and promotion of infection prevention and control standard precautions and uh, hospital acquired infection surveillance. Uh, our objectives are geared toward breaking the chain of transmission of infectious diseases through implementation of contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. The infectious disease or condition of concern include COVID-19, cholera, tuberculosis, among others. Uh, tuberculosis transmission, that is our topic today. Uh, worldwide, uh, we know TB continues to be the most important cause of death from a single microorganism. As you know, a TB is a bacterial infection. Tuberculosis is an airborne infection uh, transmitted from person to person through aerosolized droplets Nuclei. These aerosolized aerosol droplets are generated through coughing, uh, laughing, and even talking or sneezing and spitting from an infectious case of TB. The most in, uh, infectious patient is one with a positive smear. And uh, also, transmission depends on uh, several. I think which one, the one is uh, infectiousness of the TB patient. This is where the patient is active, has an active microbacterium. And also environment in which we are exposed. Either we are in an enclosed place or we are in uh, very populated areas. And also the frequency or the duration 
of exposure. The time you'll take within with a patient who is infected, who has the bacteria. On the susceptibility, we mean that the immune status of the exposed individuals. Most of our patients, or some of them are, uh, have immune issues. Okay, as you can see from that uh, picture, it might not be that clear, but you can see how tuberculosis transmission occur. Uh, short range, example, the first picture of a short range airborne expired fine droplets or droplets nuclei are directly inhaled by an individual from an infected individual. And then we have uh, the second picture shows us when you are at close contact of less than uh, 1.5 meters, you are likely to inhale those aerosolized uh, new droplets. And uh, the difference between uh, uh, aerosols and droplets, <laughs> droplets with, is uh, within and beyond one meter. When you are within one meter, you may be able to inhale those aerosols. And when you are more than a meter away, the droplets cannot go beyond one meter, that is. Uh, this uh, mycobacterium can float in the air for hours and can be inhaled. And for droplets, droplets can travel less than one meter. So it is heavy and it cannot go beyond one meter. For example, the, uh, the case of COVID-19, which was a droplet infection, eh? which falls to the ground in under the five seconds, which um, cannot be inhaled. In the second and the third picture, you can see an infected individual and a potential host, the difference of uh, one meter. You can see that uh, the formites drop within one meter and either by uh, it comes through the bronchus, the larynx, and then to the oral outlet. Huh? Uh, high risk activities. Which activities are potentially risk uh, patient or staff? Uh, these activities, we have classified them into three. Uh, we have transmission risk, that is from patient to patient. Uh, from patient to patient, a patient can be infected while at the waiting areas or in an open ward. Uh, we know we know our waiting areas at times uh, they are very we have uh, a very congested area. Also, it is an open area. So, uh, TB suspects who have come for workup also is a potential risk to those who are with them. And then we have a patient with smear positive on treatment less than two weeks can infect other patients. Also drug resistant TB patient attending follow-up can also infect uh, those who are, have come, uh, other patients also. From patient to staff, uh, as you know, uh, we normally perform some procedures for our patients, especially bronchoscopy, which can uh, bring about uh, uh, aerosolized nucleus uh, or droplets. This one, uh, you can get it through bronchoscopy procedures, suction, uh, chest physio, even during the sustation and intubation, a patient can infect staff if they don't have the right uh, PPEs. Uh, or they don't uh, know if the patient is already having TB. And also staff to patient. Uh, in staff to patient, there's delayed diagnosis of staff with TB. Uh, you know, most of the staff, they don't know, maybe he don't, doesn't know his status of TB, but he, so he can infect a patient during a procedure if he doesn't know the right uh, PPEs. 
Uh, tuberculosis prevention, that is continuation. Uh, if, for effective, effective measures to prevent TB, multitrack resistant TB transmission from person to person, especially within healthcare settings, need to be put in place. And also the infection transmission prevention measures, we, are, they, we have divided them into three groups in order of their importance. We have to prevent tuberculosis, we have to include the management in this, that is the administrative. And also we have to bring in the control, the environmental control and uh, personal protection. We'll discuss this or respiratory measures. As you can see, uh, what I was just saying about the hierarchy of uh, preventive measures, this is uh, in administrative, it is the management as you can see in that picture, management to provide the human resource, the materials to be used, the venue or the space. And also in environmental control, we have, uh, as you can see, there's a patient over there. We have, there's need for isolation or cohorting of patients. Uh, in respiratory control, we have uh, things like PPE, for example, N95. Uh, so in administrative measures, these measures are placed at the top of the hierarchy in prevention of the spread of infection because they are the most effective way to reduce the production of TB aerosol in local environment. Uh, these measures also are aimed at reducing, reducing exposure and therefore reducing transmission of tuberculosis. They comprise so policies, that is why we say it is in the administrative. They comprises of policies, uh, procedures intended to, to reduce the spread, and all healthcare workers should be involved in reducing the spread of inspection, of TB infection. Uh, these measures also include uh, establishment of the con IP infection control committee, uh, an appointment of infection control officer, which is they are appointed by the administrative team or management. Also uh, in that, the, they are heightened the clinical suspicion. We need to sensitize our clinician on how to identify uh, a suspicious case of TB and do a rapid specimen collection and processing. And also we have a direct patient flow. We, develop a flow chart of our patient on how to avoid mixing of coughing patient with vulnerable patient, e.g. immunocompromised, young or elderly patient. Also in, the, in administrative measures, we implement, the, we, normally, we have implemented of a strict cough trial and respiratory hygiene and separate, we have separated coughing patients and provide them with surgical masks. For example, in our TB desk, this is what happens. All patients are strictly on mask, surgical mask. Availability of free diagnostic tool in all departments. Nearly all departments in uh, like the outpatient, the TB desk, the clinics, they have a diagnostic tools in order to identify a TB case. Uh, also, we have uh, provision of cough and spit and room within the hospital. And uh, there are posters and signs of TB precaution, which are provided by the administrative team. Uh, in uh, environmental, uh, that is the next hierarchy of prevention, environmental or engineering control, uh, these are measures aimed at reducing transmission of TB in hospital by reducing the concentration of infectious droplets nuclear in, a, in the air. The aim of environmental control is to remove, replace, and clean contaminated air. Uh, this includes uh, enhanced ventilation, and we have also a negative pressure ventilation in uh, isolation rooms, mechanical ventilation. I know you have witnessed this if you have come uh, to one of uh, the TB areas and even in uh, our MDR wards, 
We have ultraviolet gemicidal irradiation. Uh, in, in enhanced ventilation, we are going to discuss one, enhanced ventilation. Natural ventilation is the least expensive environmental measure because it's, yeah, it's natural. It's, it's there, it's already there. It's not, it doesn't need any monetary or money to acquire it. It's already there naturally. Movement of this uh, allows movement of, 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 allows air to occur in its own because of different in temperature. It occurs on its own because it allows the temperature which is inside and outside, the pressures between the locations. So the air which is inside is move out and the air which is outside comes in and clean up the air which is inside the rooms. That is the, by opening windows, it, doors. This is achieved by opening windows and doors in healthcare facilities. And also the natural movement of air replaces stale air. That is what I was talking about. When uh, you open window, the air which is already stale in the room is moved outside, the fresh air comes in and uh, the contamin that is the contaminated air is pushed out from the room to the outside environment. Uh, the direction of flow should be considered when setting up consultation room. We are going to see one of the consultation room in a uh, TB area. Uh, the healthcare worker should sit, that is the, de the design of the consultation room. The healthcare worker should sit closer to the fresh air source and the patient closer to the outlet. This will ensure any air within the potential pathogens, e.g. the TB, is more removed, from, removed away from the healthcare worker. As you can see there, the natural, by those uh, graphic pictures there, the natural airflow, you can see the door or the vent where the air comes in. You see the first you meet is the clinician, and then uh, the patient sit on the other side where there's a window which is open. So the air comes in through the vent of the, of the door, then moves out through the window. We can see where the patient, our patient is. So the air moves straight to the window, then it exits to the outside environment. So that uh, shows us the natural ventilation. In the mechanical ventilation or the negative pressure ventilation, uh, this is a controlled ventilation, which uh, the process of, uh, what it means, it's the process of supplying and removing air through an indoor space with the use of mechan mechanical system. And uh, also the ventilation is used in setting where high risk of TB exposure is expected. Uh, for example, airborne isolation rooms and clinics, negative pressure ventilation use is used to prevent movement of contaminated air in areas with uh, susceptible individuals or patients. Uh, it's also to ensure the negative pressure is maintained. All we, to ensure the negative pressure is maintained, all windows should be closed. And those also should be closed. The air is extracted from contaminated areas should ideally be released into the outside atmosphere and not recirculated in other areas of the healthcare system, which means the air which is in the room should not be circulated in other areas. So it should go direct to the outside environment and not to any other wards or rooms. Uh, for example, what we are talking about mechanical ventilation, you can see the supply of air comes in through the vent or uh, a vent just in the corridor. And then where the patient is, then the, there's an exhaust or a structure which moves it out to the outside environment. You can see in both pictures, it is well represented and is self-explainable. We have also even a monitor in that case. Uh, the air, you can see the black, the black uh, windows 
that is where the air comes in and these are the ones are uh, extractors eh? and you see there's no window there it is fully closed so the the clean air comes in the dirty air moves out uh, in the uv uv lights you ultraviolet uh, gemicidal irradiation uh, this is an adjunct to ventilation it is an additional ventilation in a closed environment and uh, it alters the dna of microbial cells and it also is a, has a specific wavelength which is required uh, the kill ratio depends on the time and intensity and uh, it needs regular servicing and maintenance of concern is the about the con controversy about its efficacy because it is a bulb like uh, thing yeah? you put it on in a enclosed place like in mdr one also of concern is the risk insensitivity and uh, cancer issues although we have not we are not in a position to to justify those information so as you can see in the picture there that is a most likely an mbr room you can see a vent there you can see an uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, light up there uh, we have also uh, in tb areas we have cough rooms or booth rooms cough or uh, of rooms or booths uh, a cough room or a boot is a confined place where a patient goes to produce a sputum, which is provided in a, in a TB desk or in a TB clinic. Uh, this is designed uh, designated area for good ventilation to reduce the possibility of cross infection in uh, TB facilities situated away from clinical areas and patient waiting rooms. Why? Because it's a very highly potential area for infection and can spread infection easily and should have uh, in that area we should have uh, hand washing facilities as you can see there you can see the boots that is the boot area or the cough room you are talking about at the middle of the there and on this other side on the, my right you can see there's a hand washing facility there's a fan over there and then it must have large windows to allow for and uh, natural lights so that is an ideal cough room or uh, boot for uh, to for collecting sputum uh, isolation rooms uh, this is a single individual room recommended for management of tb patients uh, where a patient have to be cohorted in a room or ward the following should be considered For it to be considered, uh, we have uh, the bed spacing should be around 2.5, equal or 2.5 meters from bed to bed. As we have said, the droplets or the bacteria which is produced from a patient, uh, microbacteria, TB bacteria, which is produced from a patient, can go up to around 1.5 meters when a patient coughs. And each bed should have an individual curtains, if a mask, to minimize the spread of infection. Although if uh, there is a 2.5 distance, uh, 2.5 meter distance, you may not need uh, uh, a curtain. Do you need a curtain only if you cannot achieve uh, this one, uh, the 2.5 meters. Services should be easy to clean and keep dry. Uh, we should have uh, services which are able you are able to clean it and dry it immediately so which are not dampy sufficient hand washing basin or hand washing facility should be available to staff and patient the room or ward should be well ventilated and safe out outdoor space for relaxation and visiting with uh, relatives should be provided example of uh, tb or isolation ward or relaxation uh, area uh, for a uh, ward you can see the picture on my right the distance between the beds is almost 2.5 
and it is well lit. It's, uh, it has a hand washing facility. Patient doesn't share anything. They have their own uh, storage areas. And also you can see at the other end, this is a TB clinic. Uh, you can see there's an open space where relative and the patient can relax in an open air. They are not enclosed. And you see the up there is open. So any air that is still can move out as it allows the new air, the clean air to come in. Uh, the third uh, hierarchy of preventive measures is the personal uh, protection or respiratory measures. These measures is most appropriate in healthcare settings where the TB patients are taken care of, but particularly where a patient with MDR or um, uh, drug resistant TB are managed. Uh, this, they help in limiting inhalation of bacteria in situation where exposure to bacteria is, to TB is inevitable. And uh, this involves the use of masks, uh, such a ma surgical mask for the patient with TB and a mask able to filter out very small particles such as the 95 for those who must be near the patient like the staff, eh? healthcare, worker, healthcare workers. So the healthcare worker must be on a N95 respirator, which is able to filter small particles of uh, mycobacterium TB. Uh, we have also additional precautions. The additional precaution is the patient placement. All suspected TB patients should be isolated or cohorted in adequately ventilated spaces, at least 2.5, as we have seen there. Rooms 2.5 meter apart. Uh, while investigation, awaiting results or investigation is going on. So we should cohort this patient in those areas where we have, uh, you can have space, we have uh, ventil ventilation is good, good lightings. Also the environment or, or environmental service, or environmental or service cleaning should be done regularly. Uh, this is uh, to inform the, our housing team, our uh, public health team, to do a regular cleaning in recommended areas with the recommended uh, solution that is the uh, cleaning ag agents, which uh, for this case, we are using 0.5% of sodium hypochlorite. Uh, also, uh, the use of our equipment, utensil and linen, in our areas, we should encourage uh, one use items, which we dispose immediately after patient, after handling patients or after being used by patient. For example, the utensils they use, they are supposed to be disposable. Where not, high level disinfection is encouraged. Also in the additional precaution, we have healthcare waste management. Uh, in this treated, it is treated as highly infectious, any waste that comes from TB isolation wards or TB areas or where TB patients are cohorted should be treated as highly infectious with, uh, and then with the shortest possible length of stain within the unit. They should be removed immediately from the unit at very, at a very regular time. Also, we should have a monitoring schedule for collection. Uh, in this also, we need to provide the patient with health education. Timely health education should be provided to the patient and family on the preventive measures to be able to prevent other family members from uh, getting the bacterial infection, the TB mycobacterium. A uh, special condition or areas of con and consideration uh, in MDR TB world, patient with known or suspected uh, or suspected 
treatment failure that is chronic TB, uh, multi drug resistant TB should be identified and efforts made to separate them from other patients. Any patient who comes to the clinic should be treated as having is a possible case of TB. And therefore, especially those patients with chronic uh, have been treatment failures, chronic TB, they should be classified as an MPR while awaiting the results and should be separated from any uh, from other patients in both the outpatient and inpatient. Uh, healthcare workers, it is advised that healthcare workers who are more susceptible to TB infection should not work in high risk areas. We have uh, staff who have uh, LKA, who have uh, some condition which makes the immunity, uh, the immune system weaker, especially maybe those with the HIV, those with other comorbidities, they should not be allowed to work in a TB settings. Uh, provision of TB, IPC precaution and necessary PPEs to staff. And also, we, they should be encouraged to have periodical checkups. Also, in uh, radiology, we should schedule suspected or TB patients for non BC time, depending on your hospitals. You know when the radiology is not busy, that is when you take the suspected patient for a radiological exam. You should provide patient with a mask to wear during the radiological exam. Also minimize the length of time spent in the radiology department. That is why you take the non-busy time eh? and use the room with the best ventilation for a radiological exam for potential infectious TB patient. And in laboratory, quick processing of fetal sample to be to aid in diagnosis and take necessary and prompt so, so as to allow us to uh, the, the clinician to take necessary and prompt IPC measures to prevent other patients from being infected. Uh, surgical or autopsy procedures. This is the patient maybe we are taking to theater. In uh, theater, respiratory protection should be used by all the care workers performing any surgical procedures on all TB patients and any suspected case. All TB patients and suspected case for chest drains, like uh, chest tubes or underwater seal drainage, biopsies, other TB related procedures should wear surgical masks while in operating rooms. In uh, critical areas, uh, the patient should be managed in isolation with improved ventilation, use for respiratory protection procedures uh, like, uh, likely to create aerosol, which are likely to create aerosol uh, nuclei. Uh, also in special consideration, we have cough-induced cough inducing procedures like uh, bronchoscopy or sputum induction. These procedures should be done only when necessary. Personal protection equipment uh, should be used in addition to other uh, measures. Uh, in conclusion, we can see there that we have a TB poster which uh, is is showing us TB is airborne. You can see we have visitors, visiting times, which this poster should be placed in every area, every clinical area, area where the patient with TB is there. We have placed a patient for, for, with TB. So in case a person comes or a visitor comes or any clinician comes first to report to the person in charge of that area, before entering the room, to be given instruction before entering the room. And uh, also the instructions which are there, you should have an and, and washing uh, facility, which is to be provided there before you enter that patient room 
you need to wash your hands with either alcohol based hand rub gel you need to have a mask for a clinician you need to have a respiratory mask a respirator which, which is a n95 uh, because this patient uh, if you are going to perform aerosol generating procedures like suction or chest physio you need to have those one we have aprons plastic aprons wear aprons when entering the room wear gloves to for direct or indirect contact with the patient, with the patient or secretion, excretion or secretion. Depending on the procedure you are going to perform with that, in that, with that, on that patient, you need to assess the risk and know which uh, PP you are going to use. Also, the doors must be closed at all times. And uh, also before leaving that room, make sure you remove your PPE, immediately you leave the room. And also decontamination of the used equipment, of the of gloves, anything that you, you have come out with and do under hygiene before leaving the room. And points to remember uh, about the implementation of the three levels of hierarchy, that is administrative, uh, respiratory and environmental, uh, you need to remember all those at all levels, all those uh, hierarchy, because those ones are the ones to guide you in prevention of TB. Also, we need to adhere to airborne precaution. We have known that TB is an airborne precaution which can remain in the air for some time, even if it falls to the ground, like a place where it is dusty. The wind can move it to any other place, and you can be able maybe to get TB if you, if you come in contact with it. Also do under hygiene every time before and every other procedure or before even entering the rooms and after every other procedure that you are going to perform. Also provide health education to staff and patients I think uh, that is where we are going to conclude. We are going uh, to, I'm going to give Kibi, Kibi, Mr. Kibi Walsh a chance to maybe we take a question and concern. Thank you very much, Mr. Kibi, for that uh, very nice presentation about TB. TB is one of uh, the diseases which are not really remembered so well by our healthcare workers and by the public in general. Yet the consequences are real and uh, are devastating at the end of uh, the day. So I think uh, with that, what we need to remember always is the control measures. There is a good reason why administrative is always the number one in the hierarchy, because when administration is well organized, we will not need to go to the other two. Then uh, the environmental control or the engineering is also very key, and that one can prevent us from going to the PP level. So those are the three very crucial hierarchies in TB prevention. And uh, as a matter of fact, in all infections actually transmission of infection the hierarchies are very important so i think now we are going to take uh, questions if you want to ask a question raise your hand then unmute then uh, mr kirui and the other panelists will be able to answer your question and i can see here there is uh, there are two que three questions the one is by grace mukwana who is asking whether a negative X-ray for TB and for COVID plus negative sputum, will you still put that patient on treatment? So I think uh, I can ask uh, Rachel to handle that question. So Rachel, please. Oh, thank you, Kibiwat. Uh, thank you, Grace, for that question. So there are two kinds of tests used to detect TB bacteria in the body. 
Uh, we have the skin test, which sometimes is called the mantle test, and also the TB blood test. So when you have a positive skin test or blood tests, then uh, it, uh, it means a person has been infected with TB bacteria. So this will need further tests so that you can diagnose uh, a latent TB infection, which can show the progression of the disease. So further tests are done. And uh, like that, that is guided by uh, like what the patient is presenting with. Like for example, uh, TB spine can be diagnosed by uh, the CSF. A sample is taken and is tested for TB. So further investigations are, are, are done as long as the person presents the clinical signs. I hope that's, that answers your question, Grace. Okay, thank you, Rachel, for that question. I am sure Grace has been answered. Then we have another question uh, uh, by Joyce Mukoru, who is asking how often curtains and maybe I think also she meant bed sheets should be laundered in a TB ward. So Dabuki can be able to answer that. Dabuki, please. Thank you, Kibi. What? Linen should be changed daily or when need arises. Uh, to, that helps in, to minimize cross infection from one patient to another. So the point is they need to be changed daily or when need arises. Thank you. Okay, for IPC, that is what Dabuki has said. We need that linen to be changed daily and sometimes even two or three times a day as need arises. And linen is supposed to be treated as infectious when we are dealing with TB cases because, as Kirui said, it is airborne. So any linen from a TB patient should be treated as really highly infectious waste. Then uh, Lucas Nyamari is asking, after surgical ward, uh, after su surgery of a patient with a TB, should we need to fumigate the theater before we bring in another patient? Uh, that one, I, I think I can answer you. We don't need to fumigate. So long as we do the eye level dusting properly, we don't need to do any fumigation. And so long as all the healthcare workers are, are on PPEs, we don't need to really fumigate the theater. Then uh, Dr. Ndungu Munyiri is asking uh, uh, about the cost of treating a TB case. Uh, I wish we had people from the MDR TB ward here, but uh, according to figures from the Ministry of Health, when we are dealing with MDR TB, the cost is more than 1 million per patient. Uh, and when we talk about the cost, it is not only the cost of medication, we also talk about the cost of loss of uh, working hours, the social costs, and all the other costs. Uh, Dr. Kenudia, I think you can chip in about the cost because you, you are from the pharmacy, so I, I'm sure you can be able to help us here about the real cost, the, the cost of drugs, that is. Dr. Kinobia, are you around? Okay, maybe I can still take that one to Rachel. Rachel, maybe you can highlight on the post. Uh, uh, we are guided by um, the Ministry of Health treats uh, tuber tuberculosis for free. But yeah, as uh, Mr. Kibiot has said, there are other uh, costs incurred like the um, investigations like nutritional care, like monitoring the patient, but the medication for TB, which is given in the TB clinic is for free. That is in KNH and government hospitals. Okay, thank you, Rachel, for that addition. Kirui? Uh, I think also uh, for that person who is going to be in, a, in an hospital for a long time, it will be economically de uh, deprived of his own uh, uh, income, so that patient may not be able to, in the in the end, 
is is not going to have have an income and so this patient i think is going to spend a lot even the relative are going to spend a lot on this patient on taking care of him medication other medication not other supportive care uh, thank you kirui Helispa Murio is asking whether we can test for TB in stool in children. Rachel, I don't know whether you can you can answer that. Uh, uh, not, not that I know of, but maybe we need to find out and maybe get back to you. Okay. No, uh, in stool, it is not yet, yeah. Yeah, actually in stool, uh, it's not, that is not the routine we usually do. The real tests are the sputum. And the sputum we do is that- Sputum CSF. Yes, the sputum and CSF. Those are the ones we do mostly, but chest X-ray are usually used as indicators for po possibility of presence of tuberculosis. Then uh, Gideon is asking whether there are laws that warrant mandatory isolation for positive TB patients in Kenya. I think last time I checked, there are such laws which are enshrined in the Public Health Act, whereby if a patient refuses treatment, there is a way they have to be confined because such a patient is a risk to others. So there is such a, a law under the Public Health Act. And then uh, Margaret Warungi is asking, uh, in an event that a child misses BCG, do we still do man two test? Rachel, can you handle that, please? Uh, when a, a child misses BCG, as soon as uh, the child comes into contact with a healthcare facility, they should be given BCG. And uh, a man two test is done in view of uh, diagnosis or if there's been exposure or if the, a, a patient, an adult or a child is exhibiting the signs of TB, which are not yet confirmed, which include the weight, weight loss, night sweats, fever, fatigue, cough for over three weeks, chest pain. That is what would probe uh, a man two test to be done with a negative uh, for a child who has not had a BCG uh, vaccination. Thank you. In addition, yes, yes. Yes. In addition, BCG is also not recommended for any person who has ever received the BCG. And especially also, it is not recommended for adults who are above 35 years, whether they got a BCG or not, because it is presumed that they have already gotten the exposure to TB and within the body system has already developed the, the immunity against such. So thank you, thank you Nabo, for the addition. And then uh, Gilbert Kabogor is asking, how long should we keep the dispute term uh, for it to be said that it is no longer easy to get the, the diagnosis of TB? Rachel, can you answer that? Is there a period of time that we must take that dispute term for tests before we before it is uh, deactivated in such a way that we cannot be able to get the TB vaccine. Uh, yes, precautions need to be taken once the sample has been collected, uh, and it needs to be to get to the lab with, within two hours, and it has a special container that it will be carried in, where it is safely transported to the lab, and that test is done two hours after the moment. The has been collected. Rachel, we are losing you. We had been a place where there's a, a stable network. But I think what she has said is that when we get a sample, it is always important to take it for analysis within the shortest time possible in special containers. Because actually, as a clinician, there is no point of asking for sputum when we don't intend to take it for analysis in time. Then Hassan Hussein is asking whether if you have received BCG, is it possible to get the disease again? Rachel, that is you again. 
Okay, seems we have lost Rachel, but I can attempt to answer that one. Uh, it is true you can get TB again because you remember uh, the, in the presentation we said there are predisposing factors. You may get to a place where there is real huge large amounts of the bacteria that that is a, an exposure. Two, you, you can have lowered immunity, like if you are suffering from HIV, like uh, cancers or any other immunocompromising situation you are likely to get TB, even if you have been vaccinated before. Okay, we are moving on with more questions. Which is the best diagnostic method for TB for children below five years? I think the best is that one of uh, genetic identification. It is called gene expert test. That is what has been used across the world as a confirmatory uh, method for accurately testing presence of TB, the gene expert. That was from, um, uh, what was? Libuta. Libuta, and Libuta. So thank you for that question. Uh, the other question is, uh, uh, he says, anonymous, uh, these are an, an anonymous attendee. How do you advise for IPC for a, for, for a student diagnosed for TB in school? So it is just the same standard precaution, which we have talked about. If the patient, the student is already on medication, they, they should continue wearing the mask so that we don't risk others. We can maintain the distance, as in the cases where, let's say they are sitting in a classroom, let that patient, that, that person be at least on occupying their own desk. And what is important is just to inform that student the risk he poses to others, and also to give the hope that within three months, the TB would have gone with the correct treatment. Then, uh, uh, I don't know whether there are other questions. Uh, we have Rogers, Rogers uh, Were, uh, a very insightful presentation. Thank you. My question is, what is the current decontamination protocol for infection? Do we start with deep water or soapy water? Rogers, uh, that is from Rogers Were. Maybe Mr. Kibiot, you can take on decontamination protocols. Okay. Usually the decontamination protocol depends on what are you trying to decontaminate. If it is uh, an instrument we have used in theater, we usually start with an enzymatic cleaner, which is, uh, it is called enzymatic detergent. In most cases, it's called endozyme. That one removes all the bio burden and uh, makes sure that any droplets of blood, pus, small tissues are already wiped from the instrument. Then we insert in a decontaminant. Remember, the first process takes place in, in the ward. The second process, which is now beginning the decontamination process using the jig, sodium hypochlorite, and any other available material starts from CSSD and ends there. So in the ward, we start, we start with endozyme or what we call enzymatic cleaner. In situations where you don't have enzymatic cleaner, I think uh, we can just go direct to the sodium hypochlorite but using soap and water would be okay. But now the risk of exposing the person who are doing the cleaning is usually high. So we always recommend the contamination process to be two way. Start from the ward by doing the general cleaning and removing the bio burden. Then the next process should go on in the CSS, the or sterile sterilizing unit. I don't know whether there is any other question. Yeah. Uh, from Maxwell Ayoro, uh, you have asked what happens in a case where there's, the patient should take uh, four tabs and realize that the patient has been taking two for some reason in the initial phase. And then question number two, what is the current TB diagnosis and how long does it take to have the results? I think we have, been, uh, uh, we have discussed about the gene expert, which is almost immediate. 
And also we have a radiological exam, which is a confirmatory. The, the gene expert is a confirmatory. The radiological exam is almost, those are immediate things that you can do to a patient in an outpatient area, and you'll get results within the same event, the same day. So for question number one. And, and the treat. That, that is under treatment. When you say the patient is supposed to take four tablets and they are taking two, that is what we call under medication and will easily result in multidrug resistant TB. So here we, as IPC, we always say, it is important to educate that patient on the importance of, of, of taking all the medications as prescribed by the clinician. So here we just need to do a lot of talking because there really, there's really no way of confirming whether the patient has swallowed the four tablets or not. So health education here is key. Mm, Alija or Gaza, should we, uh, your question, should we have a specific place for TB patient to be served to avoid closed infection in our health facilities? Uh, like institution like ours, uh, KNH, we have a TB desk where we serve our outpatient a TB patient with TB, and uh, also they are served there. So the, the administrative control is part of it. They should provide that uh, space to be to serve patient with TB. And also, when you are booking clinic, you normally cohort patient. You book clinic for patient with similar condition to come at the same time. Unlike, uh, so you should not be mixing patient uh, in clinic. Then anonymous, can a Mantu test remain positive even after completing TB treatment and for how long? And uh, then how can one be sure he has recovered? So I don't know whether Rachel is still, is online, Rachel? Are you back? Yes, yes, I'm sorry about the yeah, network can, problems. Can you see uh, a, a patient having a, can a patient remain with a positive Mantu test? even after treatment? Uh, not that I know of. I just know we need them. We read the MANTU test within 48 to 72 hours. After that, it, it is not helpful for, for, for diagnosis. Mm. Mm. OK, that is a very useful answer. Then uh, Betuel is asking, kindly talk about urinary LAM tests in patients infected with HIV. Rachel, do you have any idea about that question? LAM. Uh, uh, kindly rephrase the question. So maybe the, the person who asked the question should, can be able to yeah, tell us exactly it. what he means by LAM. Yeah. Then uh, if the an immunized child is like is uh, okay, like twelve years. Do we still give BCG? Let's say this person has not received any BCG until he or she is twelve years. Can we still be, give BCG? Okay, like uh, Mr. Ndabuki has uh, talked about, it is a patient not more than thirty-five years. If he's not more than thirty-five years, he can still receive a BCG when he comes in contact with an healthcare. Uh, person or the, uh, with, an, with an immunization team, he should get BCG if she has never or he has never been immunized. Uh, uh, Emily Diangui, you have asked, uh, there is, is there a role of ESR in diagnosis of TB, especially in TB medication defaulters? Uh, ESR? Uh, Rachel, are you able to answer that question about ESR? Or Mr. Kimbi, what? Uh, okay, about the ESR, uh, I, I am not sure about the role, unless if Dr. Kenutia is online, can be able to answer that question. Uh, hi, this is Rachel. Yes. I think when we do the ESR, uh, we are diagnosing the, the immunity of the patient. So it's a full blood count. It's combined with a full blood count just to back up the, the TB results. But uh, it, this is a, a, 
I would give the chance to a clinician to answer or uh, Dr. Kinuthia. Okay, as they prepare, there is another question here about uh, how many BCG doses do you recommend for a person up to 70 years uh, and feels at risk of TB infection due to contamination risk? So I think this one, uh, we just get TB once in a lifetime. Before we do a repeat for an exposed person, we are supposed to make sure that we do the Mantu test to confirm whether the immunity is still there. So the BCG is always just once. Then can gene expert be done from blood where sputum is not possible as we not more of extra pulmonary TB. Yeah, there's, there are a lot of more uh, extra pulmonary TB in the community. Uh, and the gene expert can be able to identify that. But here, as IPC, we always talk about the pulmonary TB because of the infectiveness that is uh, usually entailing this kind of TB because it is, as Guru said, it is airborne infection. Another question, at what point do you classify a case of TB as MDR? Rachel, can we handle that? That is from Bethuel Lunani. At what point do we classify a case of TB as MDR? So uh, MDR is classified after failure of response to treatment in the first line of, of uh, TB medication. This could be due to defaulting or due to comorbidities that are developed during treatment of TB. Okay, I think that one is very clear. It is when a patient is not responding to at least, is it one or two groups of the anti-TBs? That is when we say this is an MDR TB and they usually alternatives to that. So even if it is MDR TB, there is a way of trying to treat it. That's what I was saying. That is where the, uh, it becomes now costly. Okay. Um... Abdim Alim, uh, a patient, uh, your question, a patient who has a symptoms of TB but tests are negative. Is it advisable to start a TB treatment trial and monitor improvement? Uh, Rachel, are you able to answer that one? Are we yes. advised? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kiroi, we can respond on that. Yes, yes. Further, further, further investigation so that same are devised before we begin treatment. Then uh, um, Vic has asked, can all healthcare workers be given uh, preventive treatment? Uh, maybe bearing in mind that they are more exposed. Is it a, a viable solution to prevent TB? Rachel? Uh, healthcare workers who work in the TB, who are exposed to areas where the, the TB is managed, like the TB clinic, like the MDR TB ward, they are usually given uh, uh, a prophylaxis of three months of isoniazine, but they are also advised to have yearly checkup just to check on their status and, uh, and they're monitored. So it's important to adhere to the precautions as advised. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Edna Warento is asking, is it possible to get TB if a patient coughs? Uh, I think she means from behind. That one is very true because we said TB is airborne. It doesn't matter where a, a person coughs from. Even if they are ahead of you, or behind you, beside you, it is airborne. It can be taken to either direction by the wind. Okay. More questions, Kirui? Uh, from uh, Henry Kisa, we're joining. Uh... He was asking a question about when he was joining the, uh, the School of Medicine in 1970s, they were being given a booster BCG. So uh, he's asking, 
Why not uh, now? Booster BCG, Mr. Kibiyosho. Uh, maybe Rachel can handle that also, the booster BCG, is it necessary? Thank you, Kibi Watts. Uh, according to the current guideline, nowadays we don't receive a booster BCG. Yes. Why? That is true. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have Janet who wants to contribute something about uh, diagnosis done on a school going person. Janet, you can go ahead. Janet, are you online? Okay, I think uh, she is not around. Any other question, Kirui? Uh, from Osea, James, can an HIV patient start TB management without lab works? Oh. Uh, Mr. Dabuki, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, not, every, not every HIV patient has a TB. So TB, you have to confirm through the necessary and through the investigation, the present that did. And nowadays we are guided by evidence-based treatments where we need to have confirmed results on the same. So it is not advisable to begin a patient on TB, though is uh, having HIV, though we know HIV is a risk factor for TB, but it does not mean every person who is suffering or living with HIV is having a TB at the same time. So it is not advisable. We need to have confirmed results. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ndabuki. Uh, you have well answered that question. Uh, Mr. Nyamumbo Isaac, a child presented in our facility lost, our facility lost to follow up in uh, CCC, but due to complaints, we did a gene expert and confirmed TB, but now after starting anti-TBs, she started having rashes all over the body. Do we relay, do we delay the initiation of to ART or we wait? It's now three weeks. Uh, anyone in the panel who can answer that question? Yes, Kiru, if, if the child has begun a treatment and then they develop such rashes, it is advisable the child to be taken back and then to be seen the characteristics of those rashes, further investigation need to be done, and then the necessary action need to be taken. So the child need to come back to the clinic and for further, further management, further investigation, because you can't say it is because of the, it's because of the treatment and also it may be because of the treatment or not. So the child need to come back for further investigations. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ndabuki. So from the panel, is there anybody who has uh, an answer which he or she feels need to be taken to the public? At least you can unmute, unmute and uh, give us your thoughts. Oh, sorry, Kibiwat, uh, please elaborate on your question. Oh, there are people who are saying they need to be given some chance to answer some of the questions. That's why I'm giving, okay. giving them the chance to, to talk. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if there's no participant. Hello. Yes. Yes. yes uh, I wanted to contribute. Yes. yes. Your name? Uh, Janet. Yes, Janet. Continue. Uh, I, I wanted to make this contribution. I yes. didn't hear well how this was responded to about uh, somebody who has been diagnosed and is going to school. As a scale up uh, program, the best thing to do is if yes. this is a, a this is a border in school, 
or whether it is a, a day scholar, the people yes. that uh, they are in contact with, maybe in the dormitory or in the classroom, should yes. go for uh, for TB testing. I believe that is the standard. I don't think this was a touch on. And somebody, yes. something else, blood cannot be used for gene experts. That is why even sputum that is blood stained, blood stained yes. can, is not an appropriate sample for gene yes. experts because blood is yes. an inhibitor. HB is an inhibitor uh, yes. in PCR. So kindly yes. note that unless it has changed, it is long since I was on the bench, but uh, my training on gene expert, any blood stained putum cannot be processed for. So blood cannot be used. There are other samples that should be used if it is extra pulmonary TB. Thank, thank you, Janet, for that uh, information. I think we missed that one. Okay, thank you so much, Janet. Thank I think so that, was a, that was a very important addition, and I'm sure it has benefited many people in this forum. Uh, uh, Janet, are you still there? Yes. Yes, yes I'm here. Uh, just, uh, there's a question from Daniel Waringa. Yes. He's asking, how does one go about treatment regimen in cases of MDR TB? Do one uh, do one up the doses of uh, resistant drugs or maintain the dose and add a second line? Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. When we are doing a gene expert, yes. uh, the gene expert when you are doing TB, it can yes. give you the drug that uh, the particular isolate is sensitive yes. to. When uh, for those who have uh, done gene expert. Yes. You 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 will see drug resistance on the on the on the on the what on the on the results. Yes. So there is a regimen that is given for drug resistance. And please, drug resistance is more than two drugs. That is when you call it. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, multi drug resistance. Yes. Yes, Dana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it is not one. If it is resistance class. Yeah. If I, that as a drug resistance, it is more than in case the TB that has been isolated mm -hmm. is resistant to any of the drugs that are given. So there's a particular regimen for drug resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet, for that. Okay. Then um, uh, maybe you, you don't go yet. If somebody has uh, been for, for uh, some time, then they disappear from treatment. When we, he reappears again, do we restart from zero or we start from somewhere? We must start from somewhere. The okay. who's a client to follow up, mm. uh, you retest and uh, that when uh, maybe answer like this across. Okay. I'm, I'm answering this across. Yes. When somebody comes, they... got cured or treatment, they restart. It could be somebody maybe got fit. So always start with testing, answering the question. I think Janet, we are, we are getting. Uh, clinical diagnosis. Uh, uh, okay, Janet, I think you are in a place where the network is really unstable. So we can hardly hear you clearly. Always. Hello. Hello. The uh, network is bad. Sorry. Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, can hear you, you hear now. Me? Maybe you can stand wherever you are now. Okay, I'm saying okay. Uh, any any diagnosis that is done clinically, always yeah. the outcome of treatment is always poor. Okay. So if you compare clinical diagnosis of TB and bacteriological diagnosis, the outcome is best 
when there is bacteri uh, bacteriological diagnosis. Okay. So always go for that unless it is extra pulmonary TB. Oh. And uh, as uh, one of our colleagues answered, uh, it is not always good to use drugs haphazardly. When we do isoniazid the preventive therapy is for those that not exposed because of their work, but like young children who are exposed, like uh, they have mothers, they are born of mothers who have TB. Those are the ones that you use IPT, not the people working in, um, in a TB labs or attending to, to TB patients. So always just take care, don't just use drugs unless you've been diagnosed, just any drugs, even if it is Panadol, don't just use unless you have to. Okay, thank you very much, Janet. Janet, you have uh, contributed a lot this uh, <laughs> afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, are there any more questions, Kirui? Mm, I think. Okay, I think uh, we, have done, we have done most of the questions. Others, there, some people have asked questions which have been addressed before. So, but we can always assure you that when you have any other burning question, you can always contact infection control unit uh, and you will be able to be answered appropriately. Uh, I don't know that there is any hand raised. Okay, so Dr. Kinudia, the HOU of uh, IPC, maybe you can give us some uh, keynote address about the presentation and about IPC in general. I hope uh, Dr. Kinudia is online. Yes, I'm here to be what? Okay. Sorry, I, was, I wasn't able to respond earlier. I was trying to... Um, do another meeting physically, but I think you have done a good job. Um, keep the word, Kirui, and the panelists, Rachel, Gideon, Janet. Uh, thank you so much for taking this time. I think TB is one of the issues that we, most of the people in the other parts of the healthcare system, uh, we are a bit ignorant to it because mostly we may not be interacting with TB patients on a daily basis, but it's something that we have to think about. And I think just to re-emphasize that infection prevention and control measures plays a very key role in uh, reducing the spread of TB among patients and healthcare workers. So again, just to re-emphasize re that we always need to think of the IPC measures as we handle our patients, um, whether they are TB, they have TB or not. So for I, as IPC unit is just for us to keep re-emphasizing and resensitize uh, all healthcare workers to think of patient safety and healthcare workers safety and implement IPC measures as we offer services in our various areas. Uh, again, I realize that um, there's a lot about management of TB that needs to be discussed. Probably working with the CCC team, uh, we could have further uh, discussions on um, especially diagnosis, issues of treatment, issues of MPR, uh, TB management. There's a lot that needs to be done. So probably, um, with the, in collaboration with CCC, they actually are the ones who invited us to make this presentation as one aspect of handling TB in terms of infection prevention and control. So I believe there's still more in place that's coming up. So look out for more webinars on TB and let's all keep learning together. So once again, thank you so much team and to all the attendees for joining us. We wouldn't have done this without you we didn't have spoken to ourselves. So with that, thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon. Back to you, Kibiru. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kenodia, the HOU of Infection, Prevention and Control, Kenyatta National Hospital. So as she said, we'll still continue discussing more about TB. We want to 
as I saw the data yesterday from the Ministry of Health and the TB cases have been coming down, we want it to come down even further, especially with embracing of IPC, standard precautions by all healthcare workers and pushing it further to the community around us. So with that, I think uh, we have come to the end of today's presentation. If you have any question, you can always post it to IPC and uh, the, the, for those who are in KNH and those who are outside KNH, you can still call through our exchange and you can get the correct information on IPC measures concerning TB. So I think with that, uh, Kirui, thank you very much for the presentation. Dambuki, Rachel, the panelists, thank you very much. And then Janet, uh, the panelist uh, who was who came as a as a host speaker. Thank you very much. So I think Can uh, I with just that... say something before you go. Okay. Uh, always, please don't. Uh, uh, always, TB should not always be treated anonymously with uh, mm. uh, sputum. You use sputum okay. when it is pulmonary TB. If it is extrapulmonary yes. TB, you use any other sample. If it is bone, then it means you're supposed yes. to get a bone specimen like bone marrow. If it is in the kidneys, you're supposed to get an aspirate. So the TB that you suspect if it's pulmonary, that is the only time you use sputum. Any other time that you suspect extrapulmonary TB, you get the specimen from the site that you're suspecting the TB from. Thank you. Thank you very much, our panelists. So with that, I think uh, from my PC, we are here to say we appreciate you for attending the presentation and we'll do it more, maybe on TV or, not, or on other topics, but uh, we appreciate so much and we'll be having another session next week. So with that, I think uh, that will be about the pediatrics. So with that, we can say goodbye from here. Thank you very much. And have a lovely afternoon.